Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Carson Phillips. I work at the Holocaust Center and have the opportunity to work with Vera as well. And I'm just going to be assisting Vera with the program this evening. And thought we would start off, Vera, probably telling us a little bit about what your life was like before um, the Holocaust started, before the occupation of Prague, and what it was like to grow up. Hello. So good evening. I'm happy to be with you uh, in such a rich uh, audience. And having to answer the, the first question, Life in Prague before the Second World War was really comfortable, pleasant, and uh, sometimes com compared to life in Canada, where uh, we had uh, the rule of law, protection of minorities, and uh, really up until the arrival of the uh, persecution, I didn't really know, uh, or couldn't say that I suffered from anti-Semitism. I was even unaware of any hostile feelings, if there were. I'm sure there were some, but uh, they were really well hidden because the law would have never allowed anyone to act upon it. So my, my young years were very comfortable. My father was a lawyer, an employee of the Czechoslovak government, where he ascended to the responsible position of the chief counsel of finance ministry. And that alone shows you that uh, uh, that country has tried to promote people according to their talents, not according to their religion, origin, or whatever people otherwise perceive as important. And uh, that, uh, uh, these young years were, of course, uh, very uh, poorly preparing us to what was in store for us, which, of course, uh, started much earlier than we as children became ever. I talk in plural because I had a sister, uh, two years my senior, and we have lived in a comfortable, nice surroundings of Prague. Those of you who know the city will agree to live with me. That's a very pretty, uh, comfortable city. And uh, up until the pressures which began to mount in the late 30s, and uh, exert, of course, coming by refugees from Germany. Uh, but as children, we really didn't take all that uh, too seriously because we were too busy with school, fun, play, and enjoying the day-by-day -day life. Of course, that all had changed very abruptly the 38, 39, towards the uh, you know, expansion of occupation by the Nazi military. So I don't I should compare. So Vera, one of the uh, elements you've often spoken about is how your life changed and the first time when you had to go out onto the street wearing the yellow star. Maybe if you could tell us uh, how your life changed. Well, you know, the life had changed very abruptly through that one morning in March 1539 when uh, I woke up to a broadcast of uh, the radio that announced that a country is being occupied by the German forces. And uh, I, I, the, the adults, maybe my parents, of course, tried before that to uh, leave the country because it was obvious that Jews in Europe will have a very tough time and nobody really wanted to um, wait for the blow to come down. But uh, it's sad to say that in those days, uh, there, were no, no, there was no country really that was willing to take in Jews, to open the <coughs> gates, to take in the refugees who obviously could not live in Europe and did have nowhere to go. And oh, it, it pains me to say so that uh, at that time, nobody had a heart to understand that they should uh, go out of their way to offer haven to those who were defenseless and persecuted totally uh, without any other reason but the fact that we were born Jews. So that, uh, the Nazi occupation proceeded very quickly and with a great deal of efficiency, everything had changed almost overnight. My father lost his position in the ministry uh, where he was kicked out with no any pensions of uh, rights. And uh, the schools were close to us. We had to comply with curfew by evening being at home uh, and having to stay there till morning. We were not allowed to use public transit. Prague moves usually with streetcars or buses, none of which was allowed to us. All we could do is to use it between four and five in the afternoon and then the last car. We couldn't shop with other people and we were issued different ration cards when the war broke in September 39. And with that uh, uh, fall came also the prohibition of all Jews to attend teaching centers from kindergarten to university. So all of a sudden we were without any possibility to continue whatever our aims, hopes, plans, or dreams were. And then we had to f a fast restructure our life, which also became, became affected by the fact that no Gentile was allowed to employ us. We couldn't access our savings, we couldn't access what we owned, and, we, uh, uh, and the Gentiles were encouraged 
to not to socialize with us or assist us in any way, shape, or form. And then a little later into the occupation, we have been forced to wear the yellow Star of David, which was yellow piece of cloth, six-pointed yellow piece of cloth, which had an inscription Jude, which is in German Jew, and that to be attached on any outer clothing. And that, I remember, was a very difficult day for me when I the first time had to step out in that on the street. Because um, up until then, at the occupation, the uh, hardship of it was mainly f the concern of my parents, but now I was singled out, branded like that, to walk, and now I didn't know what to uh, expect or anticipate. And I've heard that in uh, surrounding neighboring countries, Jews were beaten up, spat upon, their hair was torn out. So I remember I stood and was coming back and forth, trying to pluck up the courage and get out of the apartment, marked like that. You know, perhaps it's hard to understand for grown-ups, but I was then 13 years old, and uh, though terribly fearful of what awaits me there on the street. So finally I did go, and uh, I must say that never anything never happened to me. And eventually I got used to it, and was, uh, and sometimes I even had the feeling that um, people around us were embarrassed to see uh, suddenly among them people they knew, went to school with, socialized with, walking with this type of patch of clothes, singling them out as something uh, what we are supposed to be perceived as inferior, something as lesser people, and not having the rights, which we, of course, the Germans uh, repeatedly uh, stressed, never having the right to live a li life worthy of life. So, uh, yes, that's where these were very rapid changes, and because we couldn't pursue our <coughs> education, so the idea, the rumors began to spread that we will be deported, from Prague, or not only from Prague, from any cities, and it uh, became mandatory to learn some skill which will sustain us, or what we hoped will sustain us, in some eastern regions, which were, again, you know, we didn't have any factual information, but there were always rumors. I think the uh, Germans let the balloons of rumors out to see maybe reaction. They were always spreading rumors which nobody could really say if it's real, true or not. But it, it, so it was said that we will be deported to the east, and there we will be able to live among ourselves, and then perhaps we will have some chance to work, because at that point no Gentile was allowed to employ us or in any way, shape or form help us. And so that should be perhaps easier, and maybe also the food rations, which now the Jews received rations much diminished over the rations which were allotted to the Gentiles, all that will be somehow better in, and in, improve quality of our life. And because historically spoken in the past, expulsion and readmission to towns in which we were living was not a new to Europe and happened in the Middle Ages and later. So we thought well, that has been already here. Well, perhaps we will be able to sustain ourselves elsewhere. And to that extent, we have been trying to learn new skills. And so my sister became an apprentice to a seamstress, and I was sent to a, a newly reopened Jewish hospital in Prague, because we, at that point, could not be admitted to general hospitals, because as Jews, we had no right to receive care there. And then I was sent to the Jewish hospital, which was opened to offer help, and then I was working till our deportation, which came upon in May 1942. So Vera, during this time you've often talked to me about one man who did help your family and I wonder if you would tell um, everyone here tonight about this one individual and the impact that he had on, on your family. Well, you know, that, at that point uh, the Gentiles were uh, all um, encouraged not to socialize with us, not to have anything in common with us. And my father, the member of the Czech, Czech government, had many friends, uh, lawyers in similar position, uh, who were our friends. But with time, they all took their distance, and they um, uh, you know, gradually withdrew from us. And then, of course, I thought it was a terrible sign of disloyalty to abandon a friend in uh, troubles. But uh, with uh, the hindsight vision, I can realize that we were terribly dangerous to them, because the Germans punished people who uh, chose to violate their bans and prohibition so severely, and an occasion not only the perpetrator, but also his family, sometimes his friends, and entire occasional street. So by 1939, uh, 40, we were virtually in Prague, the city we knew, and had countless friends alone. 
but there was a, there was a friend of my father, a man who did not live in Prague, who had a tobacco warehouse in Theresienstadt, which was a, a garrison city, some two hours removed from Prague, who uh, periodically from over the years would come to visit my father. And in those dire, dark days, he still would come at a great risk to his safety. He would knock on our door at, with an appointed knock and bring us what we couldn't buy because our rations were so, min, min, so reduced by the Nazi rulings. And would reassure us that he will always stand by us and will always try to help us. And it so happened that it's a sheer coincidence, which is nothing, nobody can claim uh, that it was uh, somehow planned, that the Nazis have decided to open in uh, countries they occupied uh, transit camps in a, in a way to deport Jews from Europe to uh, eastern regions in which we so naively hoped will be some kind of a region where we will be able to reestablish our existence. <laughs> At that point, they decided to open transit camps in different countries to assist in the logistic of deportation. Because uh, at the same time, there was a war in the East where the Nazi uh, Wehrmacht was locked in struggle with the Soviet forces. And the same trains that supplied the German men in uniform uh, were needed to deport the Jews to East. That East eventually, when we learned about the death camps, which all were in Poland or Belarus. But at that point, it may sound incredible to you, but we really didn't know that. Though rumors had it that we will, that we are standing close to the final stage of our life, we dismissed it as um, incredulous. You know, because we, in the first half of 20th century, it seemed incredible in, in those days to people that there is a nation who claimed to be an avant-garde in culture and technology, who does, didn't have illiterate savages among them, who would put to death people for no other reason but for the incidence of birth that we were born Jews. So you perhaps may think that's hard to believe, but we did not, we accepted the fact about the death camps only in the camps when we finally had a confirmation that this is happening and very close to where we were. But coming back to the friend of my father who faithfully was coming to our place, he remained standing by us, and because, for different reasons, the Germans have decided to use the garrison town of Theresienstadt as a transit camp on our way to that east, and he had there the tobacco warehouse, he assured us that he will stand by us as much as he would be able to and help us all along. And that he did till moment last. And he has, uh, when, we went, when we arrived in Theresienstadt, Theresienstadt is the German name, I use intermittently with the Czech Terezi. Where we arrived, he arranged for us to not to be deported immediately to the east, because the very same 5,000 people with whom we arrived in Theresienstadt were three days later deported to a death camp in Belarus, which the name of which is Bali Trostinets, and they died to a man. So I really know that if not for Mr. Bleha, and that is his name, uh, I would have died on May 17, 1942, which would have coincided with my 16th birthday. So Mr. Blehart was a hero, an unsung hero, a man who remained faithful to his friend till the last day, a man who uh, helped us to remain, who saved our lives when we first arrived there, and who met me in those catacombs and uh, uh, these uh, uh, underground passages in the fortress and brought us some food, but then all of a sudden he, he no longer can get in touch with us. Uh, we have missed him, we, we hoped and prayed that he was safe, but he was not. But of that I learned only after the war, that uh, somebody uh, found it in his heart a malicious anger to deport, report him to the Germans that he was helping to Jews, and then of course in the German jurisprudence was a criminal crime for which he was arraigned charged and executed. So after the war, when I came back to Prague and was looking for him to tell him thank you, I didn't have that chance to do that. So this is always, I remember him in Spain because he was a young man, a man of heroic qualities, who, saved, who tried to save all our lives. He succeeded only with mine. And for this today, he is one of the few who are called the righteous among nation, an honor which the government of Israel bestows upon those who help to save Jewish lives 
in those dark days. So Vera, you've already told us you were almost 16 years old, just a few days short of your birthday when your family was deported from Prague to Theresienstadt. Um, and you were 19 years old at Liberation, so you were three years in the camp. Can you give us an idea, maybe, of what life was like in the camp? Well, you know, when we have arrived in the camp, so we were uh, immediately notified that three days later we will be proceeding to the east, which was a dreadful no uh, news. But uh, due to this, Mr. Bleha, we have uh, that's a long, very convoluted story, and we don't have enough time for that. But we were exempted, and uh, life in Theresien <coughs> very quickly um, became a, a routine of hard work, a lot of hunger, crowding, illnesses, and deprivation of, on all levels. So uh, when we have been exempted, my, my, at that point the Jews lived only in the military barracks because Theresienstadt, once built as a fortress, later converted to garrison town, became a concentration camp, and the Jews were, uh, we were living in different barracks. So women barracks uh, were uh, separated and barracks for men, and children were taken away from parents uh, from, any, from very early age up until 12 beds. Uh, stationed in a different homes where the administration of the camp, the Judenrat, have tried desperately to provide slightly better conditions for children, hoping that they, some of them might survive. It wasn't to be, but uh, uh, it was the e effort to adhere to uh, human decency to provide for the weaker ones, even at the at expense that, uh, uh, of the others, uh, because <laughs> You know, to give a little more food to the children meant to take it away from the others. And the allotment was so minimal, so pathetic, that uh, we all were not starved, we were famished over those years. So life was not only hard work, but it was also the, the steady threat and fear of deportation to the East, because painfully aware that we, this is a transit camp from which we will be deported further. And out of it, from its existence of the last three and a half years, uh, there were 62 transport, most of them are 5,000 or some of 2,000 Jews, deported to the east. Uh, and the fact is that 90%, over 90% of Czechoslovak Jews perished because in that east, as we have learned la later learned uh, and come to believe, was the end. Because there was the, the death camps in which uh, all what was waiting for us was death. In Theresienstadt, we had to work very hard and day by day life was uh, uh, drab and very very difficult to put up with because we the place, place was uh, uh, was not only uh, crowded but uh, in that crowding it was impossible to maintain it some basic hygiene the place was built for some five thousand soldiers and maybe a few thousand hundreds of people of the garrison and uh, at any time there were fifty to sixty thousand Jewish inmates pushed into it and this from cradle to grave young soldiers who are usually in the late teens or early twenties have different needs than such a vast cross-section of thousands of people living under those circumstances. The women barracks were usually furnished with three-tier bunks, which were supposed to sleep six. But any time, any number was pushed onto that because people had to be brought on the roof. And uh, the, the back-breaking uh, work, co combined with the starvation diet which we have received, was of course a cause of very fast deterioration, physical deterioration of many. So the existence of Theresienstadt, there were some close to 40,000 people who died, so to speak, natural death. Of course it wasn't natural. The death was due to subhuman living conditions, living in these quarters, which were crowded, of course, breeding grounds for infections. We had always cholera and dysentery and slew of other illnesses, epidemics. But there was, at that point, the German commander didn't care because it was only perceived as a, a transient station in which people will stop for a while and then the logistic of the railway transportation will allow them, we will be deported to the east. On the other, we of course had the opposing ambition was to stay as long as we could because we have with time learned what really this east is all about. And uh, I, <laughs> today it may seem again strange, but we, till moment last, we kept on hoping somehow to get out of it somehow to survive. But um, that was um, a tall order because it um, depends what, how kind of work you got. People who work with food may have a little better chance to get a little spoon of, of soup. But I have been sent to work in a hospital because I work in Prague already in a hospital. 
My sister was sent to work in the little patches of land where the Germans grew for themselves vegetables. And my parents in their forties, perceived as old, were ordered to clean the barracks. So then, uh, strangely enough, uh, I should have said that my grandmother was with us, or lost all her consciousness on that cattle car, removed from Prague to Theresienstadt, and never really regained consciousness and perished as the first one. But then subsequently we kind of hoped with the help of Mr. Blair, who was so uh, trying to assist us that we will be able to uh, do better. But with his disappearance and with uh, oncoming of winter, my sister came along with an illness and some trivial infection. But because we didn't have any medication, we did have a lot of uh, skillful, competent physicians, but they had nothing to work with. So uh, she lingered for about three months and she died. And she wasn't even 18 years old. At that point, of course, that, um, I think, sealed the fate of my parents. Because um, you can all imagine, you have a healthy 18 years old daughter, you doted on her, and all of a sudden she, she came down with something which in Prague would have been perhaps resolved with a few tablets of medication. And there she, we watched her helplessly going downhill, and there she vanished, and we have lost her. So my, I knew that my parents will probably never recover, and they really did not. Uh, so gradually, first my father, who uh, really couldn't, uh, or couldn't even accept this uh, type of life in Theresienstadt, he never developed the skill to somehow um, adapt to these conditions. So he died shortly after my sister, followed by my mother, who really lasted the longest, but uh, uh, under those conditions, um, it was really a foregone conclusion. Uh, what was really uh, most likely was that either you died going to the east in those death camps, or you died due to these subhuman conditions, which was um, hard work, uh, you know, starvation, and living in the crowded conditions, which were, of course, lent itself to a rapid spread of ap epidemics, which were ongoing. And if you are weakened, and you do not have nutrition, and you are hit by dysentery or cholera, or whatever, chances are you cannot pull through that. So the, that was about the life day by day, life in Theresians. So for me personally, the fear of the deportation was an enormously uh, difficult uh, thought because I, you left the barrack to go to work wherever and you didn't know if you will see your mother, sister or whoever you had still at time again or if they will send them away or maybe it will be you. Sometimes people were given two, three days uh, uh, summons to join a transport, but sometimes people were picked randomly and within hours put on these trains. So that, that uncertainty, uh, this uh, combined with this uh, weakened organism, with the forever uh, you know, um, s uh, passing sores and, and oozing uh, uh, wounds, and nothing had to be, couldn't be treated because there was nothing to treat it with. So that was uh, the lifestyle to which this unfortunate nearly 40,000 succumbed in Theresienstadt. Uh, the rest, of course, some 180,000 were sent further to that east, where they, of course, perished uh, mostly upon arrival. Um, there, one thing I, in the time we have left, I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about um, one man who you met in the camp who eventually became mm -hmm. your husband. And last year when I wrote an article um, about your experiences, you let me use your a wedding ketubah, and I wonder if you would tell us how it was possible that you got a wedding ketubah in a concentration camp, and a little bit about how you met your husband. Well, you know, that is perhaps the one, one um, a silver lining in all that story, that uh, late in, in early 44, uh, by, by that time my sister and my father were gone, and my, my ailing mother was in a hospital, I have met, uh, to me, a uh, very charming man, and um, I guess he was. I have his photo, I guess. Uh, and he was a late arrival in Theresienstadt because he was in Prague working for the Zentralstelle, that was the German uh, office with, uh, which dealt with the Jewish question. And he was working at the, in those uh, the, uh, synagogues which were converted into warehouses. And because he was a pharmacist, so the drugs which were uh, taken from the clinics uh, or homes 
and stored in different uh, synagogues. So he was in charge of the uh, uh, synagogue which was stored uh, the drugs. And at that point, I think he had, there he had developed a very uh, elaborate scheme how to um, uh, smuggle drugs to uh, medication staff, Theresienstadt. But that's another story which would last much longer. So, but coming back to uh, my story with him. So, uh, yes, I have met him and he was like a or should I say, like a throwback to normal time. By that time, was, I was two years an inmate, and uh, he still seemed so wholesome because he re arrived recently. But at all times, Arthur was, he never was inmate by in mentality. He retained his, uh, the persona of a, of a civilized um, man who hoped till moment last that we will survive, who had his faith that uh, not only was he deeply religious, but he was also um, boundlessly optimistic. Uh, those days it seemed to me often foolish, but it was so refreshing to be with him, uh, just to hear that, oh, certainly we will survive. So of course it was a laugh. Um, and in those hopeless dark days, uh, to find a person who you, you, who you love, who you know, uh, your, the moments you will spend with him, maybe seconds in the evening are so important. That went a long way to help you over the day of pain and starvation and all this misery because somewhere back in my mind was always that smile and I knew that he was waiting and that, <coughs> excuse me, that was uh, uh, a great uh, uh, inspiration of course to live another hour. So eventually the Germans have decided that uh, they will uh, or at least they said that they will send few people uh, to uh, Switzerland as an exchange for POWs, for German POWs. <coughs> not only we did not believe it, but my husband and my mother's boyfriend, then, he decided that if we cannot live together, we might be able to die together. <coughs> Excuse me. So the Germans did allow weddings in Theresienstadt. They allowed them in many ghettos. <coughs> I think the voice is giving in. And so we have marriage in March 1944. <coughs> <Excuse> me. <coughs> so we were married by Rabbi Dr. Friediger who was the chief rabbi of Denmark, a member of the privileged Danes. <coughs> Very well. Sorry, excuse me. In, uh, the, in Jewish faith, when you marry, you receive the marriage contract, is called ketubah, and Rabbi Dr. Friediger gave us a ketubah, which I cherished. We, I brought it and carried it with me through all these migrations of ours, and it's one of my treasures, and a picture of it is in this Prism magazine. <coughs> and uh, I have been, after the war, of course, the Czechoslovak government declared this, this uh, uh, marriage is all null and void. Thank you. Uh, but, um, and we had to marry again in Prague. And I've been married to him 55 years, and unfortunately I lost him in 2001. And, uh, uh, so, just perhaps that uh, in uh, all this darkness there was um, a special uh, gift that I found there a man who was my life companion and uh, I have loved him all those years and I was so grateful for his companionship and today for the, the memories he left behind. And we have lived in uh, uh, Prague after the war in Israel and of course uh, ultimately in Canada. So, the Ketuba is the contract, which is in Hebrew, and as I said, I will cherish it for my dalas, there is the most precious possession of mine. So Vera, since um, our time is almost to an end, um, I wonder if you would tell us a little bit um, about your deliberation day. Yeah, the liberation came really uh, oh, quite unexpected, although as I said, the world knew how uh, the war fortunes were going. Uh, we in Theresienstadt were closed in that fortress, 
Uh, we lived on rumors because, of course, there was no official uh, news, uh, no newspaper, radio, nothing. We were inmates. Some people were marched to their working places and picked up maybe some newspaper from the grounds, but that was not in the real information. But uh, towards the um, end of this unfortunate winter of 1945, the places began flooded by uh, less, less marches, and these were people who were. Um, in the concentration camp inmates who were still alive by the time the Russian army pulled from the east and the Germans were decided not to leave behind witnesses. So those who they didn't uh, succeed to kill, they forced on those frozen highways of Europe and marched them to Theresienstadt, which was the innermost concentration camp still under the rule of the Nazis. Most didn't make it, most fell by the wayside, being shot or froze and didn't make it. But several did come, staggered to Theresienstadt, covered with lice and bringing other epidemics with themselves. And at that point, the Reisenstadt was a disaster area because it was covered wall to wall with corpses. We no longer had the strength to bury. And nobody had uh, chances to, to make it somehow function. So it looked like uh, that all of us were perished amidst all these uh, you know, ravaging epidemics. <coughs> and then one of the days, uh, there was some kind of noise around uh, the walls of the ghetto, the camps, and people were pushing to through it. And miraculously, nothing had happened because normally, if you came closer to the walls, you were shot at by the Germans, by the guards. We were guarded by the SS, or also by the uh, Czech gendarmes, 100 men, 150 men strong. And uh, at that day, nothing happened. So some people, audacious enough, pushed through these walls, and still nothing happened. At that point, we were three days already without any SS supervision, but we didn't know that because the SS fled, aware that uh, the war is at hand, and now will come the time of justice, and uh, they will probably have to pay for crimes committed. So as we stood there on that highway, we heard some rambling of a motorized unit from distance, and <laughs> people speculated that these might be either the Americans or the Germans or the Russians, and of course, a uh, lot of anxiety around because if these were the Germans, you know, they would have shot us. But soon we have thought those tanks were coming and they had this, on the turrets, they had the Hammer and Sickle, the red insignia of the Soviet army. And at that point, we did realize that the EU was defeated, that the end came. And I keep on, uh, I remember the days I keep on saying that every single Russian boy appearing from those turrets smiling seemed to me to be angel incarnate. I really believe that the sky had opened and uh, I cannot even find words to tell you what we felt that after that many years of f fearing of death and uh, living with death, fearing death, uh, the humiliation, suffering and pain, all of a sudden there was an end. So all of a sudden the, the, the Germans were defeated, the, all the evil was over and we hope, could have hoped for no love which we didn't even dare to dream about when we were inmates. So I think that every single uh, survivor would agree with me that uh, the, if he still was standing upright and maybe we were just uh, or kneeling because no longer had the strength to stand, would agree with me that this was a day in which we all believed that miracle had happened, that God Almighty saved us and that there is a new day for us. So that's kind of put it in a very short nutshell how we felt at the day of May 8, 1945.